I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Cynthia Wang. Uh, she is an assistant professor in the departments of pediatrics and neurology and neurotherapeutics at UT Southwestern Medical Center and a pediatric neurologist at Children's Health. And Dr. Wang is also a form former James T. Lubin Fellow of SRNAs. Um, and I, I will give it over to you, Dr. Wang. Okay, great. Um, thank you uh, very much, Chrissy, for the introduction. And thank you um, to the Siegel Rare Neuroimmune um, um, Association for inviting me. It's always great to be um, a part of this, um, even if it's virtually. Um, hopefully that allows a lot of people who may not have been able to attend a physical event to, to still participate and ask questions. Um, so yeah, I will be talking about acute disseminating cephalomyelitis today. Um, I'll try to make you know my slide portion of the, um, the talk you know, relatively brief so that there's still going to be some time at the end, hopefully for um, some questions and answers. And um, yeah, feel free to type your messages. And um, I think, you know, Chrissy will direct me to those um, as we uh, uh, wrap up the, the more formal part of my talk. So uh, my disclosures is I was yeah very, um, very lucky to have uh, been supported by um, the SRNA to pursue you know, understanding these types of conditions and um, doing some research uh, on ADEM that I'll present um, on Sunday. Um, and because, you know, so little is known about these conditions, I will be discussing mostly off-label use of therapies. Um, so we'll start with a case presentation. Um, this is a, a five-year-old boy um, that presented um, after a few weeks of some symptoms, including a worsening headache, some right eye blurry vision, some vomiting. He initially went to a local ER where um, he did po de test positive for COVID. Um, so this is, you know, a case that happened in the past year. His symptoms were attributed to this illness and he was discharged home with parents advised just to kind of do supportive care. Um, he unfortunately returned because his headache did not get better. Um, he had another positive COVID test. Um, his neurological exam was not that um, exciting per report, though he was quite irritable, um, and this seemed to be out of proportion for, you know, the, the illness symptoms. Um, and sometimes he would be kind of sleepy as well. So at this point, um, his physicians ordered some imaging of his brain and his spinal cord, which showed the following. Um, so here uh, on the far left, you're seeing um, the... Uh, what it's called a T2 flare sequence that really brings out abnormalities uh, on MRI brain in all the areas that aren't the, the more dark gray is areas of swelling or inflammation in the brain. Um, here we see on when we inject dye in the patient to see, you know, which areas seem to be the most, um, you know, inflamed that there's actually some uh, penetration of the blood-brain barrier. Um, it's in those areas, you know, that we see the most abnormal signal. And his spinal cord is also affected, um, as you see in these images. Um, sorry, let me move this over a little bit, um, which a, with a pretty long lesion. And again, in the most um, affected areas, there is um, dye that um, uh, leaves the blood vessels and goes into the, the, the tissue of the spinal cord. Um, and I show that case because I think this child um, has many of the features that we consider um, uh, consistent with acute disseminating cephalomyelitis. His symptoms came on um, relatively, you know, suddenly over usually days to a week or so um, that he has widespread inflammation. You saw all those lesions in both his brain and his spinal cord. And our best guess of what's causing that is, is some sort of overreaction or um, abnormal response of the immune system. Uh, all this inflammation can lead to either swelling of the myelin, that insulating coating of the nerves that helps signals be um, conducted. Um, and in cases where that injury goes on too long, maybe some loss of myelin or demyelination. Um, when there are so many parts of the nervous system that um, are inflamed, there is often this uh, term that we use called encephalopathy, but really just means the child is not behaving normally, maybe tired, maybe irritable, but uh, just something seems to be wrong with um, how they are, you know, responding to um, their environment. So as a pediatric neurologist, um, I'm uh, very invested with uh, this condition because um, it affects 
uh, children preferentially. And the average age of onset is, um, uh, this patient is pretty typical. It's usually that early um, grade school age. Uh, a few cases per million children occur each year. Um, seems to be that males are slightly more um, affected than, than female children. And it's more common probably in the places and in the seasons in which we transmit more infections um, because in the majority of time, there's a history of some sort of illness in the weeks preceding um, this uh, presentation of neurological symptoms. Um, and then because I think we use a lot of terms that sometimes we don't do a good enough job in defining, I thought I would just put some of this out there. Encephalopathy, again, is a really um, key characteristic of this condition where there's brain dysfunction changing how somebody may be perceiving the environment, thinking and processing that information. Um, to go a little bit um, more in depth, um, or um, rather, you know, encephalopathy just means that there's some sort of dysfunction, which we can tell from how the, the person behaves and um, looks on the exam, sometimes by um, looking at their brain waves to see if there's abnormalities. Um, ADEM usually implies even going further than that, in which there is actually inflammation, as we can tell from neuroimaging, spinal fluid studies, um, and in rare cases when we take a look at the tissue under the microscope. Um, in some cases, the immune system can be doing what it's you know, tasked to do, which is to fight off infection. If you have a bacterial viral meningitis or meningoencephalitis, we do want the immune system to be there and doing what it's supposed to, to, to keep the, the person healthy. Um, but in Cases of autoimmune encephalitis, like ADEM, like when the immune system is targeting perhaps a cancer, um, which is called perineoplastic um, encephalitis, we think that the immune system's response is sort of out of proportion to, you know, the what's going on in the body, so that the inflammation is kind of proceeding unchecked. The clinical presentation, again, is things that evolve over a couple weeks. Um, in the beginning, it can be um, also... Um, simultaneously uh, associated with symptoms of fever, headache, nausea. And then it really just depends where the inflammation occurs uh, in terms of what the symptoms are and how severe they are. Um, confusion, sleepiness are very uh, common symptoms, but it can progress to you know being in an almost comatose state, state if there's enough uh, inflammation in the brain. If it affects the spinal cord, there may be weakness or numbness or bowel and bladder dysfunction. Um, if the inflammation affects the optic nerve, it can lead to blurry vision um, and um, sometimes uh, weakness in the face if it affects the cranial nerves. Here I just show a few other examples of how ADEM can look like. You know, it, there's always, there, there's a sense of pattern recognition, but a lot of times they, they can look different even between cases that we call ADEM. This first example showing a um, bit more kind of fluffy, less well-defined borders, a bit more symmetry in the right and left halves of the brain. Here, the borders are a bit more distinct and the lesions appear smaller, um, but still are a good, you know, larger size, a centimeter or two or greater. Um, these first two um, show white matter involvement, but it can go in the deeper gray matter parts of the brain as depicted here. And in the um, cases where the inflammation um, may have proceeded very rapidly or aggressively, um, the tissues can be very significantly injured and bleeding can result in, in the most affected areas. In the cases that there is some um, maybe diagnostic uncertainty, um, children and adults have gotten um, biopsies of the brain to see what's going on on a microscopic level. Um, and here the um, trying to use my cursor. The areas in the um, that I'm uh, showing you are, are veins, and the purple dots are all these immune cells that are congregating around the veins that really shouldn't be there. Um, and in the cases where there's too many of them and they're, um, you know, they're calling all their friends to come in and they're secreting a lot of chemicals that can lead to injury, we have demyelination, which is what's um, shown here. The blue is the myelin that's usually um, you know, around um, the white matter um, in the brain, and here are areas where that uh, myelin is um, ob obliterated, essentially. So a lot of um, things have come from how we've defined ADEM, and this stems from uh, the International Pediatric MS Study Group that proposed these criteria in 2013, that this is a first-time event, you know, a previously healthy child 
uh, most of the time, uh, multiple symptoms that we can see based on our exam and through imaging, encephalopathy or that kind of change in you know, awareness and behavior that's not explained by some sort of um, uh, ongoing illness. Uh, the MRI has to be abnormal by definition, and it shows that pattern, um, some of those examples um, that I alluded to. Um, and a real, uh, you know, major key in saying that this is ADEM and not something else is that um, the child should, um, by and large, get better after this event and that they don't have any further relapses or new episodes of inflammation um, three months after this initial presentation. Um, as we've understood these conditions better, we've refined the way we've been able to test for a specific, you know, um, disease or specific etiology to ADAM. Um, the main important one, which I think you'll hear from other talks um, throughout this um, symposium, is uh, anti-MOG related syndrome. Um, aquaporin-4 is another type of antibody that the body can make that can affect parts of the brain that overlap with ADEM, but generally it does not have that encephalopathy or acute change in mental status. Um, because uh, infections is something that we would treat differently and would not want to miss, a lot of the initial um, laboratory testing is to make sure that this is not uh, an infection, which the immune system is activated, but, you know, Helping, um, helping the person by um, trying to fight off the infection. We have to use, um, we often use antibiotics and antimicrobials simultaneously as we're treating for ADEM if we're not sure at that beginning stage. Um, spinal fluid will show elevated white blood cells uh, in the majority of cases in protein and elevated protein, which usually indicates that there's some sort of injury in the integrity of the, the blood brain barrier and the proteins in the central nervous system. Um, these are some other things that we might look at to look at, you know, alternative diagnoses such as multiple sclerosis in which we may see oligoclonal bands. Um, and there may be um, types of, uh, you know, stroke or other mass lesions where we may get increased pressure um, uh, that overlap with ADEM. If a child is very uh, sleepy or, um, you know, unresponsive, we might do a, a brainwave test of, um, uh, to look for seizures or um, to document abnormal functioning of the brain. Um, and again, in the very beginning stages, we really want to make sure we're treating um, the right thing by ruling out the, the things that can look like ADEM. Uh, like many of the other conditions um, that have been presented um, uh, through the symposium, we use the same types of first-line treatments, um, IV steroids, because it's easily um, accessible and it's really um, quick to start it, and it, those are general kind of just dampening signals to the immune system that we want to, you know, settle the inflammation and try to uh, stop the swelling. Um, we often will start thinking about other second line or, you know, therapies after uh, IV steroids, such as plasma exchange that tries to filter the blood of any antibodies, inflammatory signals in the blood, or give um, antibodies to help the, the own body stop making maybe disease-causing antibodies or flush out the system of disease-causing antibodies. Um, in many cases, ADEM, if a child does better, we still want to not necessarily take the steroids off cold turkey, but send them home with an oral taper that may last anywhere from a month to a month and a half usually. Um, again, most people do well, but they may spend um, a few weeks in the hospital and get rehabilitation either in the um, hospital setting or um, outpatient. Uh, about a quarter of them will require IC level care, and this usually um, relates to breathing difficulties, really depressed um, you know, level of awareness where we're worried about if they can protect their airway, um, if they have seizures. And it's really important to support someone because inflammation can be treated with our regimens, but we want to make sure that they don't, you know, suffer any sort of um, kind of uh, complications of, of being so critically ill and, you know, not being able to to, to be able to, to think clearly. And then as we, um, as a child is able to become more alert and aware, we hope that therapists such as physical occupational and speech therapists can help with encouraging their recovery. So for the prognosis, over time, you know, we've learned about how to recognize this condition starting treatments early. Um, you know, it's very rare for a child or a young adult to die from ADEM, thankfully. And many of them make a pretty big recovery within the first month after diagnosis. 
Um, I know many people uh, will get an MRI of the brain um, three to four months after just to see sort of what the fallout of that was. And in many cases, those lesions um, may get significantly better or almost nearly resolve. Um, as we look, uh, take a deeper dive in sort of, you know, how mood, thinking, development of a child is affected, it seems like there may be more lasting uh, symptoms and fatigue headaches, um, learning difficulties, maybe um, kind of uh, sequelae of uh, ADEM. Um, and in up to a third of cases, we do see recurrence. And because now we understand more about MOG-related syndromes, uh, we know that that is often um, the underlying cause for that. So um, yeah, the distinction of, is this a one-time episode where it kind of behaves like we would expect ADEM? that a child gets better and never has another attack versus something where there are more episodes, either episodes that fit criteria for ADEM or episodes that may just affect the optic nerve or just the spinal cord. Um, you can get one past uh, as in terms of having one more ADEM episode, but if you have another attack after that, and if you have attacks that don't meet criteria for ADEM, we typically try to call it something else, whether that's multiple sclerosis, NMO, or some other demyelinating disorder that we're still not sure of. Um, and then, yeah, MOGAD has been... Um, probably the most, you know, revolutionary thing in the last few years in terms of um, kind of under, uh, tailoring our understanding of um, ADEM. We can test for this in the blood, and it's a pretty good test that there's not, you know, um, false positive or false negatives. And that um, does help us in many ways in counseling a family because we can see this uh, antibody being quite high in the beginning, but over time it usually goes down. And in cases where it completely disappears, we can usually tell those um, families and children that it's unlikely they would have a relapse. Um, but this doesn't take away from, you know, a, a really important part of um, our job here, which is to support the, the normal typical development by lo locating um, any sort of long-term deficits in thinking or mood or behavior, and then providing accommodations to the family and school so we can um, optimize that person's um, outcome. Um, the same way if you have a problem with movement of your arms and legs and you would need physical therapy, a big part of ADEM is offering cognitive and behavioral therapies um, to support, you know, um, typical development of thinking and, um, um, uh, and mood, uh, mood regulation. Um, so we definitely partner up with our psychiatrists and our neuropsychologists and psychologists for that. Uh, monitoring for relapses and in cases where it is deemed to be something that could be relapsing, providing therapies to um, decrease the risk of ADEM occurring again or some other demyelinating syndrome is important. Um, so hopefully that'll give us some time. Let me stop sharing so I can see uh, if any questions have filtered in. Thanks so much, Dr. Wang. Um, Yes, we did get one question um, regarding MOG positive ADEM. Are there any trends that might help predict whether a child will be monophasic or not? Um, yeah, that's a really great question. Um, there's been a lot of articles that have started to address that question, and it seems that um, you know how, how quickly and how dramatically that MOG antibody titer and somebody lists a titer there um, decreases. You know within the first couple of years seems to be really important. Um, we typically see most kids, um, you know, decrease that uh, that number after the um, uh, the colon is you know, kind of suggest how, how high it is in the blood. So um, it's not surprising in the case of this um, uh, other, uh, um, this family member that it starts really high and then over a year or two, it goes down. Um, it's still not consistent how, you know, how long we should check this. I usually check every six months for probably the first couple of years just to see what the trajectory of that titer um, decrease is. Um, if it goes to zero, I think that's a, that seems to suggest that the immune system has learned its lesson. It's not making these antibodies, and it's unlikely that child would have another attack. Um, but you know, in rare cases, it can go to zero, and a person can have attack. There's cases where somebody has a titer that's persistent, but maybe low, and never has attack even after 10 to 20 years. So um, I think the the jury's a bit still out. Um, but I generally can you know provide some reassurance if that 
that uh, antibody goes down quickly and if it you know um, disappears. Great, thank you. Um, oh, so this person is uh, their their child. It seems um, has a loss of vision. Um, so, is that what is that in correlation to ADEM? Is there anything you can provide context on with that, or if, if mm -hmm. that's common, or any kind of treatment? Yeah, um, let's see. Um, yeah, it's often quite striking how um, how severe the vision loss um, with MOG, MOGAD, MOGAD can be. Um, a lot of times it can decrease quite quickly where a child may not be able even to, you know, see motion or even see light. Um, typically, if we get steroids and if we do things like plasma exchange, we can reverse that. Um, but it's not uncommon still to have, you know, some problems with visual acuity. Um, this person is mentioning, you know, 2020 um, is, you know, normal vision. So um, uh, it seems like um, their, their daughter is struggling with uh, having, you know, difficulty with um, distinguishing, um, you know, uh, visual acuity. Um, yeah, I would say that's that that can be the case if it's quite severe and if there's some delay to treatment. Um, at our center, if somebody is not able to see motion or light, we really start the thought process for plasma exchange soon. And it seems like that overall might lead to better outcomes. Um, yeah, I would say the first probably three to six months is when we see that vision come back. And then we're kind of left with, I think, you know, what the fallout with the tissue injury is. So um, luckily with MOG, it um, doesn't seem like um, the, the visual impairments are as significant as um, NMO related aquaporin 4. Um, but yeah, it can, you know, certainly be quite limiting. So we want to work with the families and um, the school to make sure, you know, we're providing um, children, you know, uh, ways of being able to, to see things in bigger text or listen to um, things to, to help, you know, relieve some of those um, potential deficits. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry, was there anything else you wanted to add or? No, um, yeah, yeah, and it's hard to say. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, sometimes how we tailor our thoughts about like, do we put somebody on immunosuppression is also how bad an initial attack is. If you had bilateral, um, you know, both of your eyes were se severely affected, um, sometimes that will, um, lead us to counsel families different on, you know, do we put somebody on a medicine to try to prevent another attack? Because um, it would be quite devastating, you know, if you had um, physical impairments or significant visual impairments after uh, a first or second attack. Um, and then it looks like there's a question about uh, a foundation um, to disperse. Well, I, th I think, you know, that just being part of the symposium, what the um, Siegel Rare Neuroimmune Association is doing is um, really helpful. Um, certainly, we hope that these symposium engage not just um, patients and families, but providers, and that you can tell them, you know, for somebody who may not know about these conditions, you provide the website to the R, um, to the SRNA, and they, they can, um, you know, be uh, a kind of proponent of your child and family by looking into these conditions. And if they feel like this is, um, you know, uh, too um, subspecialized for them, there's a list of providers I think that um, you have available. So you can um, have consultations with people like me who see more of this. Um, yeah, and I think the way families can help is just, yeah, to, to share, you know, information about these conditions. Um, and it seems like we're building that network with um, all these conferences and, you know, podcasts and other types of educational media. Yeah, I think COVID has thrown a wrench in some of, you know, more of our engaging in-person events, but um, hopefully this has, this has widening our reach. So, you know, people who have an internet connection and they can look at this material, you know, kind of now don't have an excuse not to, to, um, to learn a little bit more and try to understand it better. Great. Um, we did get a question about um, treatments and their effectiveness, um, depending on the timing. So can you kind of just go over the importance of how quickly or how important it is to receive acute treatments?
quickly mm -hmm. after? Does it make a big impact? What's the time frame that you can actually administer these treatments after the inflammatory event? Um, yeah, I think, you know, hopefully most of the time ADEM, um, you know, it looks so concerning and it progresses to a point where, um, you know, families get uh, you know, worried because their, their child is not behaving appropriately that um, pretty quickly we're able to get imaging that confirms um, the diagnosis. So, um, you know, ideally we would see IV steroids get started within um, a day or two of a children presenting, you know, to an ER and getting that imaging. Um, the center's practice in terms of things like plasma exchange and IVIG is more variable, partly related to just, um, you know, uh, equipment and uh, personnel. Um, we're a big center that we like to do plex if we know that, you know, there's significant um, impairment in things like walking or there's significant vision impairment. So I think we tend to just have a kind of lower threshold to start those treatments. Um, but yeah, usually ADEM, uh, except for those very severe cases, can respond, you know, very well to steroids alone. So um, sometimes I'm actually having to dial back some of our, you know, trainees that we don't need to go to Plex right away. We can take a few days, see how the five days of steroids, you know, go. So um, in case of things like MOG, um, yeah, the steroids seem to be really uh, sufficient in many cases in reversing a lot of the, the deficits. Okay, thank you. Um, we got a question about vaccines, and um, is there any evidence or research going into possibly the correlation between vaccination and um, an ADEM attack? I just yeah, so um, you know, ADEM I think was initially called post post infectious or post uh, immunization post vaccinal encephalomyelitis. Um, but that's probably um, decreased a lot um, with um, improvement in how we, you know, make vaccines. They used to make like, you know, vaccines like the rabies vaccines. Um, there would actually be neuro tissue in the vaccine. So you can imagine if you, you know, um, inject somebody with brain tissue that could probably be triggering to the immune system to, to make a response to what's in it. Um, and, you know, that's not the case anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I think there is less known if like, if your immune system is primed to sort of overreact because of genetics, you know, could an infection trigger that? Yes, um, we know kind of a vaccine trigger it perhaps, but I don't want to make that assumption that just because you got it, that's, you know, that that was what caused, um, you know, things that trigger the immune system um, maybe lead to ADEM, but from all the data we've had from other diseases like measles, um, from this year of looking at COVID, you know, there's a dozen or more reports of COVID associated ADEM. I think I've only seen one in which there was a temporal associate with, association with the vaccine. And you have to imagine a lot more people have gotten the vaccine this year than, you know, have, have contracted the illness. So um, yeah, it's not impossible, but I think it's a numbers game. So that's when, you know, when I counsel my families of uh, patients who've had this, you know, I almost unanimously say, you know, get vaccinated because you would not want to get the infection and that would be a much stronger stimulus to the immune system. Okay, thank you. I think we're just about at the end of our time, um, but I really, we really appreciate you joining us and volunteering your time and expertise on this topic. And uh, hopefully next year we'll be in person, but I'm just so so happy to be able to at least put put on this event and and be able to bring in people from all over the world. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, um, and then you know feel free to reach out to me if any questions trigger, and I'm always happy to come back and talk and do podcasts and so forth. But yeah, awesome. take care, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the symposium. <laughs>